you can be in a collaborative model. Uh, and, you know, we were able when we right came now, in. I'm, uh, I'm actually can't. looking at that to support the way the boomers have actually done it through numbers, and I'd be happy to share with you guys in the future on that. But I had my hand up for a different uh, issue. Okay. Uh, I, I can see also another dimension here, tying in to earlier what uh, from, I think Tom or Colin was talking about this, about, you know, uh, recency and uh, keeping up with the Joneses, having, to, you know, your center of influence, who do you listen to, staying on that, t t on that task, this uh, issue comes up about, you know, so spending versus saving issue because it becomes all about spending now you know and uh, for, from that point of view the, the consumption part of it today is just staggering it's just been sort of like you know where, where I see it adding is this uh, for, I'll give you an example like let's look at what's a prime time TV right Prime time TV is not prime time for the prime shows. Prime time TV is as follows. Mom or dad or mom and dad both come back from long days at work, uh, picking up kids from sporting events and stuff. They get them back to uh, back home. Uh, and they feed them, you know, have them shower, feed them, put them to bed. And then at the end of the day, prime time, they sit back in front of the TV. So all their defenses are down. And now you get all these uh, uh, messages coming to you, so some subtle, some not so, about this beautiful self you taking vacations uh, with, you know, drinks with umbrellas on them, inside them, and stuff like that. And the first thing you want to do next morning is how do I get that money to, you know, treat myself? Because, you know, this is what I've heard people are doing and stuff like that. Hey, you're making 3%, I'll show you how to make 10%, 12%. Stuff like that, and these messages, these consumer behavior researchers, the marketing guys, they they know what trig, what are the triggers inside us, who initiates the buy decision and stuff like that in the house. Is it a kid? So get into Barney shows or something, you know, wherever it comes from, where the parents can't resist and so on. And so we are getting bombarded, media by media, constantly to buy, buy, buy because then you're a beautiful guy you know, or a beautiful gal. And how do we fight this compunction? Because, you know, as a boomer, you won't believe we uh, increase our consumption in nominal terms, in real terms, real dollars, we increase our consumption from 1985 through 2010, 3% every year in real terms, with inflation that's 6% a year. That's close to China's real GDP growth rate over the same time period, because we buy all their goods. Wow. And uh, in 2006, for the first time, savings went negative. As a nation, we lived outside our limits as a nation. And that's really also hurting us here, the debt crisis and stuff. But that's a segue to the behavior because the spending saving decision is also hugely macro for us as a country, as citizens of this nation. And we need to all be in it, you know, whether it's through Occupy Wall Street or it's through these classrooms. There is a well. This and this 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 is where I get into my thesis that we have vi virtually ignored the individual in the development of economic theory, and this this business of behavioral economics is as close as we've gotten to dealing with the individual. But I think you can see from all these experiments, there's nothing individual about these. There, the, the, these these two are done on a macro basis. Although it helps us understand individuals, it's not individual and its implications. That's our work. That's what we do, is help people understand what's going on in their brains and what's going on in their buying decisions, and that what they do does, in fact, have implications for the nation and for the world, that it's not just about them. Uh, some time ago, about 20 years ago, I conceived of the, the, the three rules of financial planning. Uh, I'm a little bit famous for it. I, I still think it's pretty good advice. Save more, spend less, don't do anything stupid. 
as uh, as as a fundamental. And uh, and as we work with individuals, helping them look at what it takes to save money over time is part of the job. Uh, there's all these products, but there's still the how much are you saving? How much are you deferring for a future that will require you to have resources? Chad? Yeah. Yes. yes. My question is, so getting back to the, to the, uh, to the TV, I just, I'd like to add one comment and then a question. As we live over here overseas, we receive all of our TV programming via Armed Forces Network, which is basically all the broadcast stations provide free programming to troops, troops and families that live overseas. They do so with zero advertising. That's the understanding that there's no commercials. And I have to tell you, the one year my family lived back in the United States, <laughs> my kids were bombarded with commercials on TV. And their whining, their needs multiplied, I mean, exponentially just went through the roof. And it was absolutely due to this fire hose effect of the commercials that they saw on TV. So I guess that leads to my question, is it, is it the commercialism that's leading to this um, overconsumptive behavior, or is it the actual programming that's changing the way we see things that that's what we need? Because I, I guess my question is, I've never had Nickelodeon. I didn't see what was on TV. Uh, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, if what was being programmed, uh, you know, put out 30 years ago was pretty... Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, happy Days, uh, they lived pretty well. I'm thinking of uh, Richie Cunningham. and, uh, and his, You've probably seen the reruns, but I, I think... Uh, I don't think it was quite as overt, uh, but... It certainly was there. I've heard this argument and this complaint for a pretty long time that that it was the commercials were generating this negative consumptive behavior, and you know, I don't know how to combat it except uh, talking about it. And uh, you know, I, I'm no more of an expert than you are in terms of observing what's going on in society. I, I really appreciate your your commenting about your kids. I think that's that's uh, rather extraordinary uh, that, that their behavior well, changed in that short a time. I think we, today we people are... Micro, we live in a little microcosm. Sure unfortunately, um, fortunately and unfortunately for us, we just, um, we're not exposed to the same uh, typical consumption behavior that the average American is living over here. We just, we don't see it the same <laughs> Well, again, when we're advising clients, part of what we need to know is what are the, what are the circumstances? One of the first things you go through with a client is what are you, what are you spending? And, uh, you know, they'll, they'll put out a number and then the next question is why are you spending it? And frankly, a lot of financial planners, so uh, take a mulligan on that one, uh, that they don't really get into the why are you spending what you're spending issues and how do you really want to control your financial life. Uh, a lot of financial planners will just take it at face value and, uh, and not go further. And I, I think it's one of the most important jobs that a financial planner has. But I will tell you that I hate that. My Personally, I, I hate getting into somebody's budget. It, it feels really intrusive. And, and it violates their privacy. But if you don't do it, and so one of the things that's emerging, frankly, are specialists who deal with cash management. And uh, my daughter's one of them. It's pretty interesting to watch her uh, function in this world and in an area that I truly don't like very much. So anybody got a hand up? So where are we? And what, what, if you, as you read this material, did the question, what is this all about, emerge to you? 
Why am I learning this? Chad? Yeah, I guess, like, like I mentioned before, I, I took a lot of this on face value. I'll be honest, the one uh, piece of information that was posted that I, I really kind of went, okay, now what do I do with this, was the, um, and I don't have it here in front of me, was the National Plan for uh, Financial Literacy. I thought that was really, really interesting. Well, I'll tell you one, one thing uh, is that pe financial education works to inform people about what the issues are. It does not help them make decisions. People do not make decisions based on what they know. That's, a, that's another process entirely. That's uh, you know, this whole issue of structuring uh, retirement plans so it's easy for people to opt in. Uh, the nudge concept that uh, has been written about. That stuff is uh, stuff's real important. Uh, it's People don't make quality decisions for themselves without advice. It's, there's too much and they get scared and they get uh, what's that one one category over information? Um, information overload. Too much information was uh, was one of the categories that we studied in this in this chapter. And thank you, information overload. Uh, and people Nothing. suffer from information overload and they <laughs> what happens when they're overloaded? Right. Yeah, they you know they were okay yesterday without this stuff. Why won't they be okay tomorrow? It's uh, and it's real. And and think about your own reactions to some of this. You know, one of the things that's that's true is that it, even with the education that financial planners get for themselves, their care for their own affairs is not necessarily something they'd want to flash across the internet. Uh, that. that Financial planners don't necessarily make good decisions for themselves. They don't make the decisions that they would make for their own for their clients. It's sort of stunning. Not to say everybody's a. Unfortunately, I agree. <laughs> so you know, I guess uh, part of what I'm thinking about this material is that we need to know what these issues are, but. We have to take them with a grain of salt. I, I guess I was, when I read the overconfidence chapter, I'm going, and why do I care about this? And, and what good would this be to me in a client situation? And I, I'm not coming up with an answer. I, I think that I'm glad to know that it's an issue. I'm glad to know about it. I'm glad to have the education. But, uh, you know, is this particularly helpful? Um, you know, my clients aren't over aren't overconfident. Say, well, I think it's natural human be human behavior to have. Say, say more, please. How was that you? I think you know my clients, myself. I think of a lot of us are overconfident. This is Tom. It, when, what do you what do you mean by, by that? What do you what's that tell you? What's that tell me? Are you really overconfident? Not anymore. <laughs> you know, I, I would say that you know my experience. Well, my experience in this business, if you go back to you know the end of the century, and the stock market's going up twenty five percent, thirty four percent a year, you know we we begin to worship money, and I think we did that with a few bumps in the road until two thousand and eight. And pretty good bump in two thousand. All the inputs from the television. Pardon me. There's a pretty good bump in two thousand. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and then 2008 happened, and I think that, that we, uh, as a nation, are, are changing our behavior towards money. I mean, you know, the savings rate went down, but it's back up today. I don't believe it's high enough today, but it has gone back up. We are slowly working our way, I believe, out of this, you know, on the individual side, slowly working our way out of this morass of debt. Unfortunately, the government has just made up for it. <laughs> yeah, I, I like the idea of uh, squeezing some of these foreclosures and getting them, you know, 
to a point of not being an issue anymore. I, I wish more work had been done on that. Well, you're letting the guys have all the fun. Well, you know, as I'm thinking that um, some people that they do not make a good decision, and so you, as a financial planner, you have to educate them. And sometimes they didn't even take your advice, even they pay for it. So that is a kind of frustration sometimes I go through. I don't know how about Tom and you uh, experience anything like that. Because for my client, I charge them the fee first for financial planning. And after that, we're going to implement based on their plan. Right. And sometimes they just pay me a couple thousand dollars for their plan and not... Well, we're dealing in a, in a subject that remains a 21st century taboo. And uh, people, I, I think it's helpful, and I'm going to keep bringing up this what is money issue, but money has changed considerably since World War II, and the rules for dealing with money have changed substantially since World War II. Uh, part of my own stump speech is that money is the most powerful and pervasive secular force on the planet. Uh, money skills are 21st century survival skills. They're survival skills that don't come naturally to human beings. And that's where these conversations with learned people, financial planners, people who've gone through courses like this, people who can take an objective view of money, can share their perspectives and help them make good decisions. But just because we have that knowledge doesn't mean they're going to make good decisions. That actually requires sales skills. Even if you're not selling product, it still requires selling the concept of this is good for you. And that sometimes puts you in a position of authority that you don't really want over another person. So it's, it's very strange stuff, this money. Does that make sense? Chad? Yeah, I guess, um, so you're saying we almost have to, and, and forgive the, the word, but almost uh, preach the gospel of money, if you will. Is that what you're, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think, we, I think we do. I think that uh, society right now is, is based on money, you know, and we can complain about it. I think Dr. Basu pointed out that uh, uh, there's some real negatives in that money worship function, but... By the same token, uh, we're in a society that requires us to literally plan on living 20 to 30 years on unearned income. Even people that, that want to work to the end of their lives can't be assured that they'll be able to. So this business of saving for later in life issues uh, is no joke. And it's, it's one that we, that even the, the, the insurance companies and so forth bring out their canoes and, and paddle into the sunset uh, as if it's, it's a no problem life. I personally wish they would show people on tubes in hospitals spending the last six months of their lives in misery and half their net worth. Uh, I think that would be more honest, but you know, that's me. <laughs> uh, Colin. Yeah, I wanted to go back, uh, not to derail the current direction of the discussion, but to the uh, chapter six overconfidence, um, I completely agreed with you while I was reading the chapter, kind of like, okay, well, <laughs> where would this come in Thank for you. the client? Um, but but in, in this discussion tonight, I realized that maybe it doesn't come in necessarily so much with the client as we need to look at ourselves and realize that we may be over this sort of thing and kind of look at it and try to look, look at it in regards to ourselves and our relationship and then what we're advising the client rather than maybe what the client's doing. Maybe it's more of what we're doing and how that impacts the client or our attitude towards ourselves and what we're doing. I think that's really well put and uh, thanks for sharing that. I think that the, the cockiness that we can muster. I, re I remember when we first got into the money management business, uh, which is different than selling mutual funds. 
in a whole lot of ways, but I, I remember promising to myself that if I ever thought that I was really a qualified money manager, that's the time I needed to stop. Uh, that, I, that I didn't have the education of a CFA or, you know, that, that we, that we were really hiring experts to do the money management. It wasn't us doing the money management. Does that make sense? Looking for confirmation here. Uh, <laughs> At any rate, uh, I think overconfidence is a real problem when it comes to anything involving money, and particularly managing money. It's very difficult. Chad, you have your hand up? Yeah, if I may, I, I guess I saw the overconfidence as really one of the biggest things as opposed to uh, downplaying it. I read that, uh, I, I can't remember which article it came from, but I read the study where the Department of Defense had offered um, basically severance packages to a bunch of members back in the early to mid-90s. Yeah. And right. they anticipated a 